Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Welcome back to another action-packed, fun-filled, exciting What Matters to Me and Why, again. And believe it or not, uh, if my count is correct, this is the 42nd uh, What Matters to Me and Why presenter. Uh, back uh, in 2012, Jonathan Fing and myself went to the chancellor and uh, asked if we could start a program like this, and he graciously not only accepted, but uh, said he would uh, provide lunch for us, too. So we're thankful for that. My name is John Stupar. I teach in the School of Engineering, and as a member of the organizing committee, I'm just kicking off our event today with some introductory remarks. And uh, I think I've already said since 2012, we've already hosted over 40 members, and uh, I counted 42. And uh, this program was developed with the intention to encourage reflection on values, our beliefs and motivations in the lives of those who shape our university. The series explores personal journeys, experiences, choices made, difficulties had, faith encountered, commitments formed, challenges, and even joys that have been revealed, all with the hope that these stories will help us to understand diverse pathways in life, work, and leadership. Such understandings, we believe, are crucial for fortifying tolerance, strengthening bonds, and supporting the virtues that make us who we are as we celebrate diversity right here at UCI. Today's featured speaker is Dr. Thomas Parham, Vice Chancellor of Student Affairs for a short time <laughs> until he uh, moves on. That's why we are so happy to be able to get him before he leaves. And this is the end of our, our year program. Uh, Dr. Parham will be introduced by our own very uh, own Professor Doug Haynes. Thank you, John. Uh, I want to add my warm welcome to all of you uh, to what matters to me and why uh, on this very special uh, Orange County Day. Uh, it's a privilege uh, for me to introduce our featured uh, presenter today, uh, Dr. Thomas Parham, who serves as Vice Chancellor of Student Affairs. Uh, I've known him for many years, and it's particularly bittersweet, because as you know, he'll be joining the California State University campus as president at Dominguez Hills. Uh, it's sweet because to see a member of the UCI family a long-serving administrator who's done so much for the campus, a member of the teaching faculty in the humanities and social sciences, as well as just a standout community member, an individual who has devoted so much of his personal life to advancing inclusive excellence throughout Orange County and the nation as part of the 100 black men. And so that's the sweet part, to see someone who has done so much getting the rec recognition that he deserves. But there's also a bitter part. And the bitter part is that I've known Dr. Parham for many years. In fact, he welcomed me along with a small group of African-American faculty and staff and administrators when I joined here when I was 14. <laughs> Precocious. And during that period, what I witnessed and what I experienced is how uh, Dr. Parham built relationships based on common interests. And it's true that his connection to UCI is particularly special and unique. He is a graduate of UCI in social ecology. He was also a product of the mentorship of a remarkable faculty member Dr. Joseph White, who passed away last year. He later returned to UCI, but before that, he received his PhD at the University of Illinois Carbondale, and then launched his academic career as a member of the faculty at the University of Pennsylvania. But the pool of the West Coast 
was far stronger than the cold of Pennsylvania. <laughs> and during his career at UCI, he has uh, served as assistant vice chancellor overseeing counseling, and most recently as vice chancellor. But this event is more about career milestones, although they're very important. In truth, what, what matters to me and why is about is the journey. It's addressing the why. To understand what animates us as individuals. And if my experience in attending these events is like yours, I learn so much about people. People for whom I work with, teach with, and grow this campus with. And so I'm looking forward to the reflections and remarks of my colleague and friend, Thomas Parham. And please join me in giving him a UCI welcome. Let me say good afternoon. <laughs> what a flattering turnout. I kept teasing Doug that it's got to be the lunch, <laughs> right? And the sandwiches that are there. Um, what matters to me and why? Let me begin this presentation by expressing my thanks to Vice Provost Doug Haynes and to John and others who, and the entire community of what matters to me and why, for the invitation to address you today. I do so recognizing that my administrative and academic roles will soon come to an end next month after 33 years when I leave my post here at UCI as Vice Chancellor of Student Affairs to assume the role of President of California State University at Dominguez Hills. <laughs> the great Algerian psychiatrist Frantz Fanon asserted that people of African descent, and I would argue all people, white, black, blue, brown, or purple, should be able to ask and answer three fundamental questions. Number one, who am I? Number two, am I who I say I am? And number three, am I all I ought to be? Given that, I suspect that I should begin this reflection on what matters to me and why, not with a recitation of my academic credentials or honors and awards, that is what I do and have done for a living in my professional life. Rather, I want to begin with some disclosure about who I am at the core of my being. And there you might find the essence of an individual I am and how family and circumstance has shaped the man I have become. What matters to me is spirit. S-P-I-R-I-T. The God I worship made me a spiritual being. And spirit forms the acronym that has helped to define the circumference of my activity in living my life. The definition of my spirit looks like strength, perseverance, integrity, and then there's an R squared, resilience, but also reluctant leader. Imagination and the transformative possibilities of the human spirit. So in the time that I have, I'm gonna to try to address what is fundamentally my spirit. Let me start with the developmental years. I grew up in a single parent household, raised principally by a mother who separated from my father when I was about three years of age. And I'm forever grateful to my father who, in collaboration with my mother, served as an instrument of my birth. But I spent the majority of 
my childhood, adolescence, and early adult years without my father in my life. Watching a single woman raise four children by herself was something to behold. Even as I admire in retrospect the tremendous courage, intelligence, discipline, hard work, sacrifice, love, and faith in God it took to achieve what she did in raising her children. First and foremost, I am and will forever be grateful to my late mother, Sadie Parham. Indeed, I am my mother's child. But I'm also Pamela and William and Gerald's brother. And I'm now Davida's husband. I am Kenya and Tanya's father. And I'm a strong black man trying to make this UCI campus, my community, this nation, and the world a better place. Indeed, there's a difference between what I do for a living and who I am at the core of my being. I'm a child of God, and unapologetically so. Doing my best to serve creation with a divinity that is endowed in each of us. In my formative years, I was a product of public and parochial schools, which also provided some interesting life lessons. I was blessed to be bright enough to navigate my way through school without having to give my best effort. But much like that Parhamism I've stylized over time in my writing that says that life at its best is a creative synthesis of opposites in fruitful harmony. Let me say that again. <laughs> Life at its best is a creative synthesis of opposites in fruitful harmony, much like that Parhamism. I later came to recognize how that one strength of being bright could simultaneously become my worst nightmare, and that it made me a lazy student and learner earlier in my career. I was also a very relational child, like many in the African American children who performed well in school classes when teachers were caring and nurturing and supportive. Conversely, I performed less well in those environments where teachers were less supportive, less engaged, less caring, in some cases even hostile. Overall, however, I had the positive experience in my schooling and I'm grateful to the advice my mother gave me about education being something that no one could ever take away from you who's been there with that advice, yes? But I'm also grateful to the advice I learned through the narratives of Brother Malcolm, who reminded us that education is the passport to the future, for tomorrow belongs to those who prepare for it today. Without question, my tomorrows have been exponentially brighter and opportunity filled because of my educational background. Los Angeles was a multicultural mecca a multicultural mecca to grow up in. And my peers from the time I was in grade school through growing up were very diverse. My peers certainly were African American but also Caucasian and Japanese and Chinese American and Filipino and Mexican American. Indeed, I owe much of my appreciation for and embrace of a multicultural worldview to my formative years of growing up in Southern California's Los Angeles area. Those close connections I was able to establish and maintain with my peers allowed me to appreciate and affirm their humanity in ways that the broader society didn't always promote. And I'm a better man today because of that fact, even as I have come to embrace the consubstantial nature of our interconnectedness as brothers and sisters in the human family. We are all interrelated. Consubstantiation being that African term that means elements of the universe are of the same substance. We are all interconnected as brothers and sisters of the human family. Now, staying with my developmental years, navigating the streets of Los Angeles required a recognition of family expectation about how I should conduct myself when out in public, and a sensitivity to street predators that in some cases were common thugs and gang members but in other cases were those who wore blue uniforms and rode around in police vehicles with slogans that read, to protect and to serve. And while the reality for me and my siblings 
and really it was no different from many children of African descent. I don't want to leave you with the impression that life was that hard, even for children who grew up working class and poor. Our mother managed to locate us in housing and neighborhoods that were reasonably safe, commiserate with what her salary as a government worker could afford. 32 years for the federal government she worked as a cost accountant. We always had enough to eat, clothes on our backs, shoes on our feet, in a mindset that never knew that we were as economically challenged as we were. And while we lived in South Central Los Angeles, East LA in the Barrio, Mid-City Crenshaw District, and in the Miracle Mile Wilshire District in Los Angeles, ours was a childhood that, while modest, was happy, was full of love, was full of caring, discipline, and anchored in a strong faith in God. That old gospel expression that says we come this far by faith is absolutely true in the case of the Parham household. Growing up amid the marvelous militancy of the 60s and 70s, what a magnificent time to grow up, also helped usher in a cultural consciousness that understood at a basic level the need for black people to struggle for civil and legal and human decency. Not just civil and human rights, but human decency. One had to be strong and exhibit strength. The essence spirit is for strength. Being exposed to leaders such as Malcolm X and Martin Luther King or hearing stories about Rosa Parks and Thurgood Marshall or Fannie Lou Hamer or watching the social unrest and the riots in Watts and Newark and Chicago and Washington, D.C., among others, or listening to the R&B music of the time, Motown, the Philly sound, Sam Cooke's A Change Gonna Come, Marvin Gaye, What's Going On? Shy Lights, we got to give more power to the people. A Curtis Mayfield and the Impressions who sing, people get ready because there's a train coming. Don't need no baggage, you just got to get on board. That sets the stage for an important internal debate about adopting a nationalist versus an integrationist posture in navigating the pathway to productivity and success. Am I going to be a cultural nationalist or am I going to be an integrationist? Even watching the high profile athletes of my day, they included Muhammad Ali and Jim Brown, Arthur Ashe and Tommy Smith. They included John Carlos, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Bill Russell and many others, men and women. They all reminded me that irrespective of the domain one pursued as a life career, you could not be black in this country and escape the challenges and adversity of a racially charged society. And that, despite a document called the Constitution of the United States, there was a profound sense of incongruence between what America preached and how she lived. So even as a child and adolescent, I reasoned that even as I persevere, the P in spirit is for perseverance, through the adversities in life, there were choices that had to be made in negotiating the landscape life presented me and other people of African descent. One of those decisions was deciding on the best way to achieve social progress, either working outside the system to create this notion of revolutionary change, or inside the system to create change that needed to happen. I chose the latter rather than the former. And that pointed my career on the trajectory in which it has been aimed for the last probably 40 years. <coughs> my career began with a vocational aspiration, some of you don't know this, of pursuing employment in the field of criminal justice. You know Dr. P is a psychologist. I didn't start out that way. In fact, I spent some time in high school years thinking about how to change a racist criminal justice system and reason that change had to come from within. And thinking that I would pursue a career as a police officer or a criminal defense attorney, I even joined the LAPD's Explorer program where I was exposed to the inside look at a life in law enforcement. I then entered college with a major in criminology determined to join the domains of policing and law because that was a way that I could change my community from within. Something had to change. But while in college my first two years, my interest took a different turn. And I discovered that working within the criminal justice system was more about manipulation than really helping people. My spirit was focused on trying to do good in people's life. But in the criminal justice system, 
It wasn't about necessarily helping people. There were guilty people going free, innocent people going to jail just because people could manipulate it well. But along the way to dreams and aspirations, life happens. And so life happened to me. And a chance embrace of co-curricular learning opportunity through two internships, one in a halfway house for so-called incorrigible and runaway kids, and one in the community psychology clinic in downtown Long Beach, crystallized my desire to become a psychologist and mental health professional. That experience then forced me to confront a fundamental issue of how to align my consciousness with my destiny. Not with a career, with my destiny. That is the essence of the term ore ire, O-R-I dash I-R-E. It means one whose consciousness is aligned with one's destiny. How do I figure out what is my destiny? So after transferring to the University of California, Irvine, I met my first mentor, the great Dr. Joe White, one of the contemporary fathers of the black psychology movement and, and discipline who really changed my life in profound ways and pointed me on a trajectory towards success. He saw in me a talent and potential that I couldn't see in myself. And he echoed a message that you heard resonated from my mother that spoke many times and many years before then, who simply said, son, you do so little work and seem to perform well. If you just did a little bit harder work, you'd be brilliant. Joe's intervention in my life validated and affirmed my belief in myself, gave me a vision of possibility, provided me with a roadmap for my future, instructed me in the ways of conscious and responsible manhood, created and nurtured a relationship built on caring and trust, and then it held me accountable for producing the excellence he was confident that I could achieve. Why is relationship so important? Indeed, it was Dr. White and Chancellor Dan Aldridge and John Whiteley and Ray Navaco and Harvey Williams and Professor Karen Nelson and Michelle Chagois in social ecology and Bob Newcomb in social science, one of the best staff professors I ever had. Many of my student peers and others who were part of this early Irvine experience, they were the people that made UCI a special place to engage one's dreams and aspiration. It was about the people, not the buildings. Beyond providing wholesome environment to engage my academic pursuits as a psychologist, my education and mentoring, particularly from Joe White, in retrospect provided me with some deliberate socialization. How did he deliberately socialize and train my mind to think beside providing me just the education in the books? He taught me some fundamental lessons. First, you cannot seek validation from your oppressor. Secondly, when navigating new environments, always learn to assess what an environment will tolerate. And then figure out where your allies and where your alligators are. Align with your allies, stay away from your alligators. <laughs> he taught me, produce excellence, because excellence will bring you opportunity. He taught me that when you go to graduate school, I'm not sending you there just to be clinically good. I expect you to be good and master everything. Teaching, research, consultation, all that. He taught me that the key to mental health, particularly for a young black male, was always having a broad range of choices and options. And subsequently, I internalized a fundamental lesson imparted to me by the great Asa Hilliard, renowned psychologist who now walks and dwells with the ancestors. Because Asa Hilliard's work taught me, even as a psychologist, that there ought to be something wrong with a psychology and an educational system. Bless you. <laughs> there ought to be something wrong with a psychology and an educational system that leaves people strangers to themselves, aliens to their culture, oblivious to their condition, and inhuman to their oppressor. Consequently, my career, my journey toward leadership and the body of work I've tried to produce in my scholarship and my teaching and my mentoring has always been a quest to, number one, 
never be a stranger to myself. So I've tried to interrogate Fanon's fundamental question of who I am, understanding that as a psychologist, I am really a healer, trying to be a healing presence in the lives of other people. I've tried to be on a quest to never be an alien to my culture. So I've tried to examine and explore culture at the deep structure level, understanding that culture is not merely demographics, but rather a complex constellation of mores and values and customs and traditions that provide a general design for living and a pattern for interpreting reality. It taught me to be conscious of my condition and not oblivious to the condition of the people around me. So I've never been a fan of getting my hair relaxed because I needed my mind crisp and sharp, nor have I wanted contact lenses that colored my eyes because I never wanted my vision clouded to the realities that existed in America for people of color and other economically and socially challenged people. It also taught me that I should never yield to someone else's definition of my humanity, instead believing, constantly teaching young people that I train, teach and mentor, that each of us is a seed of divinely inspired possibility. And if you can nurture that seed in its proper context, it can and will grow into the full expression of all we are supposed to become. Let me say that again. It taught me that each of us is a seed of divinely inspired possibility. And if we can nurture that seed in its proper context, it'll grow into the fullest expression of all we are supposed to become. Now, in balancing my integrationist and nationalist ideologies within my life space, true disclosure, I have just as much Martin in me as I do Malcolm. <laughs> and speaking of Brother Martin, it was his text in 1963, Strength to Love. If you haven't read it, I invite you to pick it up. It provided me with a formula, the, the secret sauce, if you will to successfully negotiate the pathways of productivity and success. What Martin asserted is that one needed a tough mind but a tender heart. A tough mind and a tender heart. So in my life, I can say without hesitation that I've learned to do both. In fact, on my conference table in my office is a small replica of an Ashanti stool that was given to me by my colleagues in the Association of Black Psychologists in 2000 when we were in Ghana, in Accra. And it simply has a plaque that reads, Warrior Healer. When your people recognize you as a warrior and a healer, it brings tremendous obligation. But it also sets high expectations for how they expect you to conduct your affairs. Through a healer's heart, I sought to embrace the tender side of my existence, which although sometimes contrary to the ways Western society teaches men to be, informs the way I approach people and circumstance. For example, throughout my schooling and advanced education, I was always taught to be a rational decision maker, exploring the pluses and minuses of a situation or set of options and then choosing correct alternatives in a rational, systematic way. Who's been there? Who's had those lessons? All of us, yes? That's how we learn. Admittedly, I learned to do that really well. And yet, there was something at odds with my spirit in that reasoning, particularly when I could observe people deciding on a course of action that was sometimes good and other times questionable, simply because they could rationalize their behavior. As a consequence, I've developed and embraced a style where I first think about situations. I think about them first. I think about circumstances first. And before determining what course of action to pursue, I run it through my heart. Lots of us feel it first and then think it next. I think it first and then feel it. It's always been my heart that tells me what is true. It's my heart that steers me toward what is right and just, irrespective of whether it is popular. That I in spirit, the first one stands for integrity. And this is where my honorableness and my incorruptibility comes from. It's the integrity of my heart that serves as my compass about negotiating 
decision making in life. But my tender heart, my healing heart has always been balanced with a tough mind. At my core, I'm a warrior. I'm an individual capable of demonstrating great vigor, mental fortitude, courage, uncompromising advocacy for what I think is just right and true. The way I treat people, the way I advocate for the less fortunate and embrace the issues that impact people who live their lives at the margins of society, what Harvard professor Derek Bell called those faces at the bottom of the well, all that derives from the tough mind and the warrior spirit. That's who I am at the core of my being. And now let me spend a moment talking about fulfilling a legacy. When, when I think about the concept of legacy, one is immediately drawn to the past and thoughts of what has been handed down for the younger generations by the ancestors and elders, and that comes to mind. In a similar way, one of the conceptual anchors I've used to guide my career in the activities is the notion of legacy and how that colors and shapes my reality. Going back to some of the work of Brother Fanon, the great Algerian psychiatrist, Fanon argued that each generation out of relative obscurity must reach out and seek to fulfill its legacy or betray it. But I also knew that fulfilling a legacy would require a level of resilience to be able to stand up strong when situations invite a posture that forces one to recoil or simply yield to a setback. That first R in my spirit is about the resilience that we've had to show when setback came. In 1982, I remember, unbeknownst to me, by the way, before I got there, I should say this. I found out what I was told that I was the first African-American academic psychologist and tenure-track faculty member in psychology. The University of Pennsylvania had ever hired in this 240-year-plus history founded by Ben Franklin back in 1740. And I recall in my early days as an academician at Penn challenging my colleagues to interrogate the question of whether it was right or professional or ethical to be part of a city like Philadelphia, imagine this, that's 44% black. We're training doctoral and master students to go out and deliver psychotherapy and professional psychology services, to deliver mental health services to that area's population. And we had no course in that graduate program in African American psychology. I simply asked the question. And while I thought the question was interesting, some of my colleagues took offense particularly at a young assistant professor being bold enough to even ask the question. And yet, my true motive was less focused on critique, even though at some point it was an indictment of the program, but more focused on aligning our mission with the best practices that were available for faculty and clinical staff. What some colleagues quietly whispered that raising such questions was not a way to make tenure. particularly in a research one Ivy League University, but I knew that I owed a debt to the legacy that even allowed me to occupy that space and time. I'd never have a chance to highlight the scholarly ability I might have in that space if people don't sacrifice and even die so that I could be in that space. How dare me betray that legacy? That's my warrior spirit. From my mom and family to Joe White to Janet Helms to Horace Mitchell, who recruited me back to UC Irvine from the faculty at Penn, to Chancellor Michael Drake, to so many others. I hope that I have honored the time and energy and expectation they have invested in me. My constant hope has been that my efforts and endeavors, whether administrative, instructional, scholarly, clinical, consultative, or community service, would align with that side of the ledger that was judged to have fulfilled a legacy. That second R in spirit is for reluctance. As I've often been a reluctant leader in my life, even as I have been blessed with opportunities to ascend to leadership positions. Why reluctant? I recall a King disciple, former UN ambassador and mayor of Atlanta, Andrew Young, who talked about leaders and leadership. And Andrew Young asserted that he always learned to distrust those who vigorously sought leadership positions. Think about this. 
He said to me, I distrust people who always want to go up to higher positions and are always seeking them and trying to go up that ladder. Because if you really understood what leadership was about, you'd be a reluctant leader. But you would ultimately yield to the invitation to serve because your community, the children, the elders, something your community needed you. I've been that reluctant leader. Being a CORAC and a mission and clinician and scholar by training, I never imagined that I would serve in many of the leadership capacities that I have. And I've been blessed to hold a lot of them. Whether president of the Association of Black Psychologists or the Association of Multicultural Counseling and Development, I never wanted to be the vice chancellor of student affairs until the elders and other people came to me and said, it's your time. Truth be told, I never planned on being a college president until folk began to call and said, it's your time. <coughs> Let me finish up. The second I in spirit is about imagination. You want to know who I am? I'm a person with enormous imagination. Imagination is that mental process of forming ideal creations of vision of possibility and potential. Imagination focuses less on what is and instead extends to what could be. It's less about the comfort of one's immediate reach and more about the unsteadiness of one's grasp that lies just beyond what you think is possible. And that really has been my career the last 33 years. I imagine that we could have a more pronounced student affairs presence on UCI's campus. I imagine that we could create more career development in what was a placement heavy career center. I imagine that we could have a first in class mental health and wellness operation. I imagine that we could create consultation teams and deal with urgent care in crisis situations before 20 something years before people were now inventing behavioral intervention teams that everybody has. I imagine that we could constructively engage students in the way in which we manage protests and demonstrations and support free speech so that we don't have things that go on on other campuses happen here. I imagine. I even had the audacity to imagine, along with senior leadership, that we could actually get the sitting president of the United States, President Obama, to deliver the 2014 commencement address in collaboration, in celebration of our 50th anniversary. I imagine. I imagine that we could set admissions records and those numbers that are there. And along with the staff that we have, I surrounded myself with just great people, got out their way and let them do what they do but try to be out there on the front line with them. That's what leaders do. And I imagine that you could have excellence and diversity colliding in the same sentence. So today we sit with 116,000 applications when I inherited 57,000 when I took this job. For 4,420 California resident freshman spots, the average GPA is just south of 4.2, and we have the most diverse class in the history of this campus. We've shown that you can have diversity and excellence collide in the same sentence, and we've defied every myth and stereotype out there in society. Why? Because we imagined that it was possible. So imagine a voice that is not locked away in the abyss of uncrystallized mental musings that reduces it down to useless chatter, a voice that is prepared to take flight against the intellectual stimulation, and not one that's tethered to an anchor of cautious reflection, where sound is muted by that insatiable desire to seek external validation from people we think should approve of the content and process dynamics of our speech. Just imagine if we had a heart that could transcend societal boundaries and learn to love people purposefully and unconditionally. Just imagine if we had a spirit whose energy and life force is so positive, right, that no element of social distraction could derail its trajectory toward positive impacting the people we touch every day. And I'm not talking about drive-by interactions like pinballs in a machine. I'm talking about authentic connection to the human experience. Just imagine if we could do that. Imagine leaders who might see their positions less as plateaus to survey the vastness of their influence and more as opportunities to serve those who work with and for them. Just imagine the I in that spirit is for imagination. In closing, in embracing the role as healer, I knew intuitively that you cannot be a healing presence in the world 
if you lose the capacity to believe that people can elevate themselves to rightful places of rulership and mastery over their circumstance. People can do that. Circumstances are not simply static conditions. Circumstances are places people come from. It is not who people are at the core of their being. Circumstance is not simply static condition. It's a dynamic one that people have the power to change. Just imagine. So I teach others, my students, clinicians I supervise and train, people that I impact. As the wise elders taught me, that in your spirit, you've got to muster the strength in the midst of fear and intimidation. You've got to persevere through adversity that's inevitable in life. You've got to live life with integrity, being honest and trustworthy. You have to be reluctant and willing leader. You have to be resilient when life knocks you down. You have to imagine what is possible and not just probable. And you have to master the cultural disposition of transformation. Indeed, the tea in spirit is about my belief in the transformative possibilities of the human spirit, the individual condition, the organizational dynamics, and the social and environmental circumstance. What matters to me and why? What matters to me is the love of my staff who have served that vice chancellor's office greatly for all the years. I thank you all. What matters to me is the love of people in humanity and the energy and life force that empowers my spirit, which, like a divine spark, gives me my human beingness. For I can never be all I can be as a man, as a husband, as a father, as a child of God, in absence of my relationship with all of you and the world around us. Thank you very much. So we only got a couple minutes left, so questions, comments? Anybody have a question? Just <clears throat> raise your hand. We'll get a microphone over to you. Dr. Parham, you were raised in Los Angeles. And so when you were growing up, and you're going to be returning there as now the new president at the Cal State, how old were you during the 1965 Watts riot, riots? And how did they affect you? So 11 years old, I was born in 1954 in the year Brown versus Board of Education. Oh, by the way, I share a birthday October 2nd with Nat Turner, so if you want to know where my warrior spirit comes from, <laughs> right? That's how I brother roll. Um, the Watts Rebellion was something that as a child you had to understand because where I lived at that point, right off of Pico in the Crenshaw District, right off of Third Avenue, was right on the perimeter of where the National Guard were patrolling with their jeeps and rifles and bayonets. You know, that was kind of the perimeter that they tried to kind of keep everything pushed into the, you know, larger core of South Central. Did it impact me? Absolutely. Because you had to at one point manage the frustration of a people, right, who were crying out for some kind of relief from the social misery they had to deal with every day. But also you had to deal with the frustration that had nowhere to go when people sang like the whispers sang that R&B song that says, seems like I got to do wrong before they know it's me. We had to burn down a community in order to make people pay attention to that. Those are the kind of lessons that you learned as a young child. Did it impact me? Absolutely. So that's what helped motivate me to want to change the system. I put up against that wall with the N-word by LAPD, as have my brothers and other folk, just for walking while black. But, right, I refuse to allow misery to have the last word in the same way that Cornel West talks about. You can either decide to wallow in it or get up and do something about it. My life has been getting about it because I got a legacy to fulfill. Thank you for that question. Got one back here. Hey, you. Dr. P, first, thank you so much for your leadership and your service to UC Irvine. Secondly, you have my admiration and my love. And I wanted to ask you about your next journey um, at Cal State Dominguez Hills. 
what are a couple of um, the goals that you're looking to accomplish when you first get there? And what are maybe a, a challenge or two that you're mm. going to be helping them with? So opportunity. There is no greater blessing in life next to being a parent than being entrusted with the personal and intellectual growth and development of young people. So I'm looking forward to that blessing. The opportunities are there to be able to navigate and manage an entire campus. But what I'm about to do relative to vision, the first mistake you want to never make as a leader is assuming that you really are the one in charge. Right? <laughs> Shared governance is really about working with the faculty. It's about working with the academic senate. It's about working with student affairs and administration and other folk. So my job is not to go in. There's a difference, Kathy, between, for me, being a ruling leader and a servant leader. Ruling leader is this mess we got going on in the White House right now. <laughs> that's, a serv that's a ruling leader. I'm in charge. You're fired, you know, right? Servant leader is what I am. My job is not to play every instrument or teach every class. My job is only successful, same way I've tried to manage here, based upon the work that the people who work with and for me produce. So my job is to try to be the orchestra leader and create a harmonious sound. And if we can get the faculty rolling, and the student rolling, and administration rolling, and the police rolling, and the gardeners rolling, and the maintenance workers rolling, and everybody's part of that Toro family, then we'll produce a harmonious sound. So I want to help them achieve a greater congruence between what they preach and how they live in terms of their own strategic plan. I want to cultivate new investment in the campus to help them do that. I plan on making Dominguez Hills not a default campus, but a destination campus, because there's so much good stuff there, and there's so many people who care deeply about those students. But I know that we have the same, similar kind of challenges. It's a very ethnically diverse kind of place, but they've got the big four. They have a high first generation population, a high URM population. They have a very high Pell eligible population, which means they qualify for maximum financial aid for those who don't know Pell, so they're the poorest of the poor kids. But they also have a fair amount of young people who are in need of remediation. And I'm not one of those faculty members who think, well, you can't pass my class. There must be something wrong with you. First question I'm asking if somebody gets an F in my class is, what did I do to be able to reach them? Why? Because I know that each of them are those seeds of divinely inspired possibility. My job is to make sure that they, Dominguez Hills know that we are the soil into which those divine seeds of possibility are going to be placed. And we're going to water that soil and nurture that soil and till it and take the weeds of social distraction out and give it just enough sunlight of affirmation and just enough shade of critique and then stand back and watch it blossom and grow into the fullest expression of all it's supposed to become. Right? That's drop the mic time right there. <laughs> Thank you so much. That's very hard to follow. But... Uh, I um, had a question about your second R in spirit. Mm -hmm. Can you give us some words of encouragement about some of us who uh, might be faced with becoming reluctant leaders? So I, I've always embraced the reluctant leader piece um, just because I think it's a, it's, a, it's a level of humility that you have to assume as a leader if you really understand what your real intent is. There are a lot of people who love leadership positions because it gives them title, and it gives them privilege, and it gives them money, and you get to go to the conference because you lead the association and stay in the suite and everybody else is in a hotel room. That's the fluff. <laughs> but if you really understood what leadership is about, it's an enormous responsibility that is placed on your shoulders. And you have to be able to guard that responsibility and the trust with care. But you also have to understand in the same way we have a ritual in the Association of Black Psychologists when we become presidents, the president-elect is pulled in by the children. And I'm going to probably have some ritual like this when I do my investiture at Dominguez Hills. It's not just a pomp and circumstance where we go up and we kind of do this. We are pulled in by the children. Why? Because even in your reluctance that you're resisting, you understand that you are there to be able to make it better for future generations who will come after you. And not everybody is blessed with your talent and intellect. I've read your work. I've seen the advocacy you have. I've seen the strength you have. How dare you not share that with the rest of the world and keep it to yourself? I know how tough a sister you are. Yeah? 
And you know I've read your work, yes? Give me a pound for that. All right, point values are now double because we got a few more minutes. So, yes, ma'am. How are you? Thank Who you so much. Introduce yourself. Oh, my name is Myra. Hello, Myra. Hi. Uh, your words are very inspirational, and um, I, in some way, I want to follow in your steps. I also come from a lower community. I am, I'm from Compton, so I understand how what you say. How we're we're faced with challenges, and we have to rise up. We have to rise above. And I don't want to be in the criminal justice. So it's what you were saying. I totally get it. Good for you. Thank Compton you so in the much. house. All right. Thank you. Good to see you. Thank you. Thank you. And remember, your mantra is Hi. people come from circumstance but are not their circumstance. They may come from poor surroundings, but their spirits are still rich. They may come from violent surroundings, but they can still have a peaceful heart. Right? Mm -hmm. He who defines the diameter of your knowledge also prescribes the circumference of your activity. Don't let anybody define what you're capable of, right? Blow it out, girl, you can do this. Right? Let's go over here. Thank you so much for sharing your journey. It's very inspiring. Thank you. I have a question more about the imagination. What a suggestion would you give to people to stretch their imagination? Sometimes I found myself a limited um, in my imagination, I don't go beyond my comfort zone. So what suggestion you gave to people, how did your face, if any, help you with, imagine, with your imagination? So one, I had to imagine what was possible. And my team will tell you this and I hopefully and, and validate this. When we came in to set goals, we didn't set goals that were comfortable, we set stretch goals. And it's the stretch goals that allowed us to do that, but I wasn't betting on me, I was betting on them. I surround myself with really talented people and just let them kind of stretch. But what I had to do was to create the right environment that allowed them to exercise the creative juices. So how do I manage? I don't imagine that it's a, a crime to make a mistake. Ain't but one perfect being in the universe. That's the creator. Short of that, we're all fallible, right? So make a mistake. What I mind is chronic mistakes that you haven't fixed. I don't ever mind making a mistake, particularly if it's on the right intent, right? Ask anybody who, right? Sherry Rowland, Irwin Rose, Frederick Reines, if they knew what they were going to do before they were doing all those experiments. They didn't know, but they weren't afraid to try. So part of what I've tried to model for my people is to become consummate risk takers. You got to be able to take risks. You got to be able to take mental risk and stretch your brain beyond what you think is possible. You've got to take verbal risk, even being able to say something stupid on the off chance that it just might be a brilliant idea. Like what a dumb idea Nolan Bushnell had years ago when he thought that you could use a television for something other than passive viewing. And he invented the first Pong games. Remember the Pong games for those of us who remember Pong and Atari? <laughs> What a dumb idea that was, <laughs> several billion dollars later, and now we got Sega Saturn and Genesis and all this Atari and Playstations and all these other things, and now we got eSports Arena, we leading the nation in that, right? What a dumb idea that was, why? Because he took a verbal risk. And you also gotta be a behavioral risk taker. You gotta step outside your comfort zone, and you gotta trust. You gotta be able to trust yourself and trust in your capability, right? But that is, is from the environment around you. What I hope is that the team I work with trusts me. And they trust that Dr. P is going to set a high goal, but he's going to be out there with us on the ground trying to reach it. They're going to trust if we make a mistake, uh, right? We'll correct it and kind of move on because that's what innovation requires. You just got to be this, you know, that, that person that's going to go out there and set that tone. And if you can't find the validation in your own private work setting, then step outside your work setting and go find the validation someplace else. Somebody here is willing to give you some validation. Where are we at? Who's willing to give us some validation? Yes? You got lots of friends in here. We got time for a question or two more. Let's go back here. Go for it. Hold on for the mic because the mic is coming. We got to get it on recording. And introduce yourself for me. Thanks so much for your talk. Uh, my name is Wally. I'm a biological sciences undergrad here. Wally. Right. Um, I just had a question. You seem so inspiring and you're so motivated. Um, what do you do on a day to day basis to just keep yourself full, even with the challenges around you? How do you keep that mentality going? Because 
um, I'm so inspired right now, but like when I leave these these doors, who, you know what I mean? So, um, um, like, how do you keep yourself full? Thank you. I keep myself full with strong faith in God. I keep myself full with the relationships I have with my wife and my children. Y'all say hello to my wife, Davida Hopkins Parham, right here. I keep myself full with my friends and my relationships. I mean, y'all, y'all, we walk around campus all day, right? And people just, what up, Dr. P, and just pound, you know, right? I was hugging, right, Ms. Butler here. I was shaking hands with my friend, Mr. Stokos here, right? Just, right, that's the energy you feed on. When I'm looking at Europe, and we're, you know, kind of exchanging, right? That's the energy you feed on. We're welcoming new people to the, right, student services spaces and disability and support, right? <laughs> Those are like abandonment issues and we got like therapists who can help you work on that, you know. But that's how I keep myself full, you know, and I try to be as authentic as I can be. And I always, you know, it's about ideas are the substance of behavior. The way you think influences how you feel and ultimately how you respond. If you leave here and you're inspired and you go out of here and you go, huh, then I haven't done my job because all I've done has been entertainment for noontime to eat a sandwich with, right? <laughs> if you really are inspired, then part of what you gotta do is not try to be like Parham, you gotta be able to find that spirit in you. Each of us is a seed of divinely inspired possibility, so are you. And you got that spirit in you that has been blessed with a gift that's in a big place like you see that's in biological sciences which is world class. Look at the opportunities you have to just go out and make a difference. You just have to be the risk taker we talked about to think differently, to say differently, to do differently, just because. And I don't want you to be 100% better on 50 things. That's like that New Year's resolution we make that nobody remembers three months later. Right? <laughs> if I have a simple goal for you today, right, it's hopefully we've been intellectually provocative, yes? Maybe we've been even, right, emotionally stimulating, yes? But most important, Wally, is I want you to make a commitment to do at least one thing differently in your life to access that spiritual core than you were doing before you walked through these doors this afternoon. I don't want you to be 100% better on 50 things, young man. I want you to be 5% better on one dimension of accessing your spirit. And if you could be 5% better on that one dimension, 5%, and we added up all the 5%s in this room, you know, we could just change the world overnight. Who's willing to give me 5%? Yeah. Who can give me 5%? Yeah? We can do this. Good luck. One Dr. Parham. One more. One more. Go for it. How are you doing? Hello, sir. Mr. How are Sanchez, you? I'm good. Congratulations on your appointment to Cal State Dominguez Schools. We're thank all you. very deeply and sincerely excited for you. Uh, thank you for your years here at UCI. You have tons, uh, a lot of accomplishments and achievements here over the years. If you could go back and identify one achievement that will always stay in your mind, say your greatest achievement here at UCI, what would you say that achievement is? Mm. One, wow. Um, just take a shot. Huh? Um, you know, my first piece would be some of the programmatic initiatives we've developed. It might be going to the White House March 9 of 2014 and talking to their Office of Public Engagement where we thought we'd get 15 minutes and an hour and a half later, hour 15 actually, we walked out of there, right? Having thrown down and talked about why it was important for the president to think about coming. And just waxed and waned in the same kind of way I tried to speak today. And they're like, yeah, you hit this and then Obama announces he's coming. It might be that. But what really mattered to me, right? The most humbling thing a piece, in fact, I just made a video a couple months ago for our trustees and we were talking about this new building we're trying to build in student affairs. Because the campus has really neglected the student affairs infrastructure that we have to do something about because we're out of space. And somebody asked me a similar question. And this is what just popped in my head and I think it's the most authentic thing I can share. Particularly knowing that I'm a, a healer and a warrior. I was walking along Green Mall back in my days when I was assistant vice chancellor. This is, I don't know, 10, 12, 14 years ago. And I ran into a young man, Latino individual, who you knew wasn't quite a student. 
he was kind of, you know, dressed in a different way the students do, like he was on lunchtime coming from work or someplace. And he was coming down as I'm walking out of the counseling center, because I used to have a dual office over there. And he stopped me and he said, are you Dr. Parham? I went, yeah, how you doing? You know, shake your hand like you know, regular peeps. All right, what up? All right. He said, you won't remember me. Years ago when I was a student, things were so desperate in my life that I was thinking about taking my life. And you helped me. And you treated me for the depression and the suicide ideation I was having. And I'm alive on this planet today because of that intervention. This is what we do in student affairs. Life don't get no better than that. And if you can touch one person in a meaningful way, a long life's journey, right? That's worth a lifetime of all the memories that we've been able to create. If there's one memory, that stays with me. Why? Because it's not in my head, that's in my heart. With that, I'll stop and say, it's been my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.